Welcome back, AP. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom. And yes, PP. Yes, yes. I didn't. I said AP, not PP. All right. So yeah. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of another short guy, right? Just like this little dude of none other than Charles the First, the second Stuart monarch of England, right? So we left off in class talking about Charles the First and his growth and expansion as a monarch and his ability to try and actually like grow this entire idea of an absolutist in England, which is obviously like failing miserably right so we left off like talking about this guy of course right talking about like his growth and his ability to try and like suppress the parliamentary power and do things a little bit differently than his dad did right his dad ironically enough was a little bit of a better king than he was when you really really look at the two of them stacked up against each other pee -pee. when you really really look at the two of them stacked up against each other james the first actually did a lot better job at like avoiding going to the 30 years war like listening to some parliamentary like ideas creating the king james version of the bible to appease the puritans right like i mean he did stuff he wasn't good he was kind of arrogant he just wanted to have parties and hang out with the duke of buckingham all the time but the big thing about it was is he did something right pp it's important to understand that james wasn't as bad as he could have been his son on the other hand charles the first is pretty awful right we looked at this really long list of stuff that charles the first is going to do in just his first three years as king right in his first three years as king from 1625 to about 1628 he's gonna do a lot of really 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 messed up stuff Pierre he's gonna like literally listen to the Duke of Buckingham way too much which we already know is a pretty corrupt guy that of course like buddied up to his dad in a lot of like you know he just did you know like in just like what we said in class you know the thing that we're gonna put on a t-shirt right the thing about it that we need to understand Penelope I gotta like give you a shout out on that one that was absolutely hilarious uh so the big thing about that that we need to understand in class or not from class is that he did do all this stuff he listened to the Duke of Buckingham constantly he always wanted to go to war he tried to have a launch a massive invasion in Spain of this place called Cadiz right which is gonna be a huge failure and he did that also and he dissolves parliament when they buck back against him and say don't do that so another big thing about it is he listens to the Duke of Buckingham again and he tries to go and help the French Protestants Protestants during the Thirty Years' War at the Siege of La Rochelle, and of course his military forces meet up, of course, against none other than Cardinal Richelieu, his red eminence, right? Which Emma Tran and I actually learned, the reason why Cardinals wear red is supposed to be because of the blood of the martyrs, right? And also we can tell that that's Cardinal Richelieu right there, because he's literally known as his red eminence, right? But the big thing about it, though, going into it, those guys are going to end up crossing paths, right? So, like, sorry, he's just freaking out. So, like, big thing that we need to understand, though, is is that the Duke of Buckingham and Charles are going to sufficiently anger Parliament enough times to dissolve them. Not once, PP, but twice, right? Like, so they end up dissolving Parliament two different times. Also, he's married to a French Catholic. You know, the English people don't really like that, Pierre, because they're very, very actually Protestant by this point, and also many of them are actually Puritan. Stop biting me. So, like, the thing that we need to also understand, though, is that Charles is going to begin to violate some laws that are actually originally in that Magna Carta. Because a big premise of the, thank you Kermit, the big premise of the Magna Carta does actually state that everybody is due habeas corpus, right? Which actually is the idea of a fair trial and no wrongful imprisonment. Well, the thing about it though is, is Charles was actually doing these things called forced loans, right? And forced loans were basically literally a tax, quote unquote, in a way, just not calling it a tax in England during the Stuart monarchy or during Charles the first reign. So what a forced loan was is basically this just this idea. It's a premise that you are going to pay pay the king alone and he's gonna pay you back quote unquote he never does and he never will and if you refuse to actually do this forced loan you can be put in jail now that violates people's rights of habeas corpus and so in fact he's actually violating the premises of the magna carta effectively making Parliament very, very upset, angering the House of Commons, and making things a lot worse going forward, okay? And then, of course, he's going to randomly declare war on France, and he does that all because of the Duke of Buckingham, but the Duke of Buckingham does end up getting, unfortunately, very, very stabbed to death, right? So he does all this crazy stuff in his first three years of being king. But yet again, he has to bring Parliament back at one point, and before they allow him to do this, they actually force him to sign a very important document, okay? In 1629, when he reopens Parliament in 1629, they form Formally address him by saying you must sign this document known as the Petition of Right. Okay, and the Petition of Right is a simple document that a lot of people refer to as the Magna Carta. Yeah! 
2.0, right? So, and that this document basically forced Charles to say that he could not levy taxes without parliamentary consent, and also he cannot imprison people without just cause to kind of get rid of this whole idea of forced loan application that he was trying to use to increase his royal wallet. So, a thing that we need to also understand about this entire idea is all of this stuff is just Charles trying constantly to increase his royal money, right? To actually increase his royal coffers. He actually wants to do just like his dad did during this entire thing as well. He wanted to increase tonnage and poundage, and this is going to help lead to the like actual the rise of the petition of right as well. And so the thing that's going on though that we need to notice more though more so than anything else is let's take a second and take a deep breath and think about do I need to know as an AP student every single time he dissolved parliament when, where, and why, and because of whatever? Not really. What you really need to remember is the fact that Charles I is just a big baby like he's a big ninny like he all he wants to do is get his way and he wants to go and like want, launch these war efforts and he wants to do all this other stuff and every single time he got pushed back from the parliament that didn't really like him very much because they knew what he was doing trying to assert his royal authority he would dissolve them right and this is going to effectively help lead to even more tension later on but after he signs the petition of right, he eventually ends up dissolving Parliament yet again, right? He literally fires Parliament in 1629 because they tell him that he cannot increase his taxation on tonnage and poundage, right? And they also told him that they're going to get rid of it completely, right? And remember tonnage and poundage was that customs tax on imports and things like casts of wine and stuff like that, that the actual king is using to try and increase his money and his stuff. Well, the thing about it, though, is that the Parliament said, okay, big fella, not only are you not going to be able to do that anymore, but you can only do do it for one more year after this. And he says, oh, I'm so upset. And he fires them yet again. And this so on begins in 1629, a very important 11 year period in English history. It is known as the 11 years of tyranny. Now that's what the English people called it. Okay. The English people called this 1629 to 1640 time period as the 11 years of tyranny. Now, when we look at the descriptions of these two things, we need to understand what the word tyrannical means or tyranny in and of itself. It means that they're being ruled over by a tyrant, right? A tyrant is of course a ruler that is, ob is objectively out for their own good, their own sake, and they rule with an iron fist. They're very too aggressive, and the people obviously don't like them, right? Because a tyrant is usually somebody who rules through violence or also, like, you know, aggressive tactics. Now, the thing about it is calling it the 11 years of tyranny, if you're an English person, denotes the fact that the English people in the House of Commons and the parliamentarians did not like this time period. Now, Charles referred to it as his era of of personal rule. And he says that it was the happiest 11 years of his life, right? And now with the Duke of Buckingham out of the way, he turned and found a new advisor, none other than his young French Catholic wife, Henrietta Maria, who is literally related to the Bourbon dynasty and is going to, is actually one of Louis XIV's relatives, right? So the thing that we need to understand though, is their relationship was apparently ignited, right? Reignited and they fell madly in love with each other. And then Henrietta said, not only am I the luckiest princess in the world, but I'm the luckiest woman in the world to be with a man like Charles, who's willing to rule over his people with an iron fist for 11 straight years. When literally, this goes against everything traditional that English, the English economy, government, people have actually set up. This is literally going to be 11 years with no parliament, okay? And this is going to be a very, very big understanding, though, because a lot of y'all are like, but wait a minute, Mr. Terry, pump the brakes. I don't understand. How is it possible that Charles is going to collect taxes without parliament because that's what they do right the parliament's job in essence is to collect and divvy up tax money and to levy new taxes when everything is actually needed well that is a really great question emily wilson i love that question love your enthusiasm love how you're right here in this discussion the thing that we need to understand about this is charles the first is going to find ways around this of course using the advice of his now new advisor henrietta maria oh by the way y'all they also have two sons they have two children during this 11 years of tyranny as well or during their personal rule excuse me and they also do a lot of other ridiculous stuff. They re like they like have new portraits of themselves painted. He actually does all these renovations to the Palace of Whitehall. He literally calls in this guy named Peter Paul Rubens, who is a famous Baroque artist, to actually repaint the entire ceiling of the Banquet Palace Hall or the Banquet Hall in Whitehall. And of course, this is one of the most famous panels that Rubens actually painted. And it shows God right here bestowing ruling power on little fat, chubby baby Charles right there with the with the image of England. England, the female image of England, setting the crown on top of his head. It's absolutely ridiculous. This is what the entire ceiling actually looked like when it was completely done. And look at that big, over-the-top, Baroque, grandiose style, which would have 
been like worth lots of money, right? This would have cost massive amounts of money. But Emily Wilson's asking a really good question. Where the heck did he get that money from if the like, parliament's not actually collecting taxes and things like that? Well, the thing about it is, is he is going to collect taxation on his own. And he's going to find a couple of different streams of revenue. He's going to do one big thing called ship money, okay? Ship money was a pretty clever little idea that him and some of his advisors had. And the ship money idea was that he went to all the coastal towns of England. And he said to all the coastal towns, he's like, you have two options. You, one, have to either build me a boat for the English Royal Navy and contribute it to the Navy at large, or you need to give me the money for that said boat. A lot of these towns are just going to give him the money and stuff like that because they're not going to necessarily like fork over one of their largest merchant vessels and or one of their like, vessels that's actually meant for the East India Company. Or, and they're also not going to build a ship of the line because they're very, very expensive, y'all. you got to understand, a naval vessel is massive. And not only does it actually very, very large, it's got rows of cannons all over it and things like that. So a lot of these towns are actually just going to kind of fork over the money because this is a royal like decree that he's like forcing upon them. And now another thing about it, though, is he have then eventually expands it even to the inland towns and counties of England as well. And he's like, oh, well, you guys have to as well. And they're like, we don't even have a port, like, let alone that, like, boats. Why do we have to do this? And Charles said, because I said so, right? Pretty tyrannical when you think about it in essence, okay? He also does these things called coronation fines where he actually charges people a massive fine if they're to be knighted or actually moved up through the nobility. Kind of a little bit like a robe noble-esque kind of thing. It's like his version of the Paulette tax, which was really, really dumb because that, that many people actually were looking to move up in society. And also it was like actually from like earnings and stuff. Like there was the military earnings of these different individuals who now had to pay to be knighted for the right that they actually earned on their own. He also granted monopolies to several different companies that actually like brought in certain items and increased the like strength of the East India Company as well. And another big thing is he went into debt. Like uh, he went into debt with other countries. He actually borrowed large sums of money from other countries and then made promises that he would eventually pay them back, even though he had never had any intention to. So the thing that we need to understand though is during this 11 years of tyranny though, some things are going to start getting shaky and also the parliament of course is going to end up coming back. Because if we have the 11 years of tyranny, it means of course that that 11 years had a stop time, right? Eventually, Parliament is coming back. And it has to do with two things. The Parliament that did come back in 1640 was actually known as Long Parliament, right? Because literally, it never disbanded for the next, like, yarp. Uh, excuse me. When you actually look at the actual, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? When you look at the timeline of Long Parliament, you can make the argument that it didn't disband or go out of session for 20 years, right? Until the end of the military protectorate that's going to be ushered in by this next tool bag that we're going to talk about here in about two seconds, right? But the thing about it, though, is that the long parliament did stay for a much longer period of time. Usually the parliament is supposed to be in session for a year, and then it's opened and closed every single year in a very, very British ceremony. But the long parliament comes in because of a lot of crazy stuff that went down in 1640 right after it was ushered back in. Now, why did they have to come back? Long parliament came back because the king was forced to bring them back due to the fact that a book is going to cause a rebellion, okay? So what ends up going down is that Charles has this guy named the Archbishop of Canterbury, right? The Archbishop of Canterbury is the highest of, like, ranking bishop within the entirety of the Anglican Church, and the dude's name was William Laud, right? William Laud came in, and he wanted to try and kind of reignite some, like, like more traditional things, more ceremonies and stuff like that, and people are going to start getting kind of upset about this. In particular, the people that get really upset about this are the Scots, right? The Scots get very upset because at this point, as we remember, the Union of the Crowns, Scotland is a part of the Kingdom of England right now. So the big thing about it that ends up going down is that William Laud issues that old thing that Edward VI had made, right? Do y'all remember Edward, the skinny, gross, like malnourished child of Henry VIII that had that Book of Common Prayer made that was meant to regulate all of the different Anglican masses, right? Remember that kid? Remember that kid? Well, the thing about it, though, is, is that now William Laud is going to force that book onto Scottish Presbyterians. Now, the Presbyterians, who are a type of Calvinist, don't do things necessarily the exact same way as the Anglicans do. And so this Book of Common Prayer ignites a rebellion, and also Presbyterians are going to revolt against the crown. A lot of Scottish nobles are going to revolt, and this thing is known as the Bishop's War, because it was caused by the Archbishop of Canterbury, right? So the thing about it, though, that's going to end up going down 
is to fight a war, Charles is going to have to increase taxes, right? And he's going to have to actually accrue an army to make sure that no devastation comes to England or its people. So Charles is going to be forced to bring back Parliament, and he has to bring them back to fight the Scots off. That's going to be the end of the 11 years of tyranny. Now, Long Parliament comes in, and they do a lot of really intense stuff, right? Now, one of the biggest things they do is this thing known as the Triennial Act, right? And the Triennial Act comes in as an idea, it's an idea passed by Parliament to try and force basically Charles or and the entirety of England to never have an 11 years of tyranny issue ever again. So it's a formal act that says that the Parliament will come back with or without the King's consent every three years. That we don't need you to reopen Parliament anymore. We're coming back whether you like it or not, okay? Like, so there's no more of this long periods of time without us. Now, another big thing that the Parliament's going to do as well is they're all going to agree to kind of get rid of this whole you can dissolve us thing, right? So they actually agreed to not disband until they decide to disband rather than giving that power to Charles anymore. So what's going to end up going down though as well is there was a squeaky wheel in this whole thing, okay? A very squeaky wheel in this entire like system and his name was Thomas Wentworth, right? This guy named Thomas Wentworth was a member of parliament, an elected member of parliament, but he was kind of basically Charles the first best friend, okay? He was the guy, Thomas Wentworth was the guy in every single parliamentary meeting would stand up and be like, you know, the king's doing his best, guys. And then all the parliamentarians would be like, boo, shut up, we don't like you. He also, though, was considered the protector and lord protector of Ireland, right? Thomas Wentworth was sent out to Ireland to quell Catholic revolts and to keep Ireland underneath English thumb, right? Well, the thing that ends up going down, though, is that there's going to be a rebellion that pops up in Ireland underneath his watch. Now, what ends up going down, though, as well, is the parliamentarians hate him because he actually is buddied up to Charles. So what they decide to do is execute him. They're like, for your failures of actually your ability, to, uh, inability to control Ireland, and then also for your treasonous support of the king himself, we decide to execute you. So Thomas Wentworth is arrested by the parliament, thrown in the Tower of London, and he's going to be killed, right? He's going to be beheaded and stuff like that. But you cannot do an execution without the king's signature. Now, interesting little thing that's going on at this point, okay, is that where was Henrietta Maria during this entire time? Why is she not telling Charles to just crush Parliament and, like, to, like, exert his authority like the kings in France and her relatives do? Well, interestingly enough, she's not there, right? She was actually gone on vacation. She was on vacation with her two sons, Charles and James, in France visiting her family. And so what ends up going down, though, Charles is there by himself. His closest advisor, Wentworth, is now in jail, so he doesn't know what to do. And apparently what happened, y'all, is he cryingly, cryingly, like sobbingly, signed his own best friend's death certificate to be executed. And Thomas Wentworth would be executed by beheading out front of the Tower of London very soon after. Now, what ends up going down, though, as well, is when Henrietta Maria returns and comes back to England, she's like, what is going on? Thomas is dead. You allowed this. You signed off on his execution. What are you doing? And then Charles is like, I didn't know what else to do. And then Henrietta Maria, now this didn't actually happen, but I like this part of the story. But there apparently were rumors swirling around London that not only did the rebellion in Ireland pop up, not because of Thomas Wentworth, but also it popped up so that Parliament would stay in power. But the rumors so that were swirling around London said that the Parliament supported the rebellions in Ireland and actually pushed them forward to force Charles to actually like kill his own best friend and keep Parliament in session. <laughs> I know. So this is absolutely ridiculous. So what Charles does in protest to this, right? What he does in protest to this is he decides to do back to them what they just did to him. You just killed my best friend. Well, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to kill the five leading members of parliament and have them executed by royal decree. So he storms down to parliament, right? With an entire army behind him. Storms down into parliament, bangs on the parliament door that has been shut and locked because they hear that he's coming. They heard that he's coming. They shut and locked the door. He bangs on the door and stuff like that and says, open the door in the name of the king. And what they all say is, no, nah. And they apparently say no and refuse to open the door. The door is eventually broken down, but the five members of parliament that he's there looking for have escaped 
out a back door, which is so anticlimactic. I know some of you are like, and then there's going to be a square off and a massive battle in the halls of parliament. It's going to be really, really intense. No, it's not. Actually, what ended up happening is five old guys snuck out the back door, right? Which is hilarious when you think about it. It's just imagine them like going tee hee hee and just like running away because literally they're like, we're not going to give up. And they leave and they run off. And this is going to be extremely embarrassing for Charles, right? He's humiliated. So he flees to Northern England and he raises an army because he hears that those five members of parliament are raising an army of their own, okay? Now, what does that mean, though? If we have an army being raised by the king and an army being raised by the parliament, we've got none other than a civil war on our hands, right? So we literally have two factions in one like country that are about to go to war with each other and lead a massive onslaught of death and destruction throughout England that is going to be a very, very big prominent moment in English history. So what is going on, though, that we need to understand is that the English Civil War is going to last really, really quickly. Let me go make sure I got the years right on this real, real fast, because this is important to write down just to keep our like timeline kind of like all squared away. The English Civil War is in total going to last from 1642, so two years after the end of the 11 Years of Tyranny, to 1651, all right? Now, interesting little fact about that 1651 time marker is by that point, somebody else is also coming to power, and also there's several English Civil Wars all like lumped into one thing. But 1642 to 1651, you're going to see the like raging of the English English Civil War, right? Now you have two different armies fighting against each other, okay? You have one called the New Model Army versus what is called the Old Model Army. The New Model Army is the Parliamentarian Army or the Parliamentarians. And then the Old Model Army is the wealthy gentry or the aristocrats that support Charles and things like that. They're also mercenaries and they're mostly cavalry members, right? So the thing that we need to actually understand about the New Model Army and the Old Model Army or the actual like parliamentarians and the like literally the like the like king supporters right the royalists okay that you actually have fighting against each other is just like in the actual uh, like American Civil War there are nicknames that we call each of these sides by right so for example in the American Civil War the uh, South referred to the North as Yankees and then the North referred to the South as rebels right so the thing that we're actually gonna like like call these different members of uh, the English Civil War is kind of the same like nickname and it's what they were most often called. So you need to know them because when they pop up in sources, they most often refer to them as either roundheads or cavaliers. Now the roundheads were the parliamentarians, right? Now we don't really know where the nickname roundhead comes from. We're not positive positive where it comes from, but we think it actually might come from one of two sources. One, it might actually have to do with the helmets that they were very, very well known for wearing as parliamentarians. And also they would have been middle slash like middle or lower upper class members of this like new model army. And they also would have been much more like uh, like militia like, right? So they wouldn't have a ton of fun. So they also were very well known for wearing a rounded helmet, much like this one and very simple like articles of clothing. So the other thing about it though is apparently they're drummer boys and the people like they are actual uh there's like a word for like these like boys that were assistants in the army. I can't remember what it is though. So the thing about it though is, is they often times would shave their heads to avoid getting lice, right? So that's where we don't know which which one is which, the helmet or the head shaving part, which is where the round head nickname came from. But we do know pretty much that it is like their biggest nickname, right? And then also another big one, though, is known as the Cavaliers, okay? So the other side was called the Cavaliers. Now, the Cavaliers, not like the Cleveland Cavaliers, but it is important to understand that the Cleveland Cavaliers has their nickname from this war, right? The UVA, University of Virginia Cavaliers, same thing. Their mascot comes from this war as well. But what a Cavalier is, is not LeBron James, right? So like now, because, you know, LeBron James played for the Cavaliers for a long time. LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James. Uh-huh. So like now, but the Cavaliers is going to be looking more like this. This is a Cavalier in essence, okay? Cavaliers are going to be your gentry members, mostly cavalry riders, some mercenaries from Scotland and things like that, and they are usually very, very wealthy, right? Now, everybody says that you could spot a Cavalier by three things about their person that made them very easy to kind of recognize on the street, right? A Cavalier was very well known, one, for their very long and luxurious hair because it meant that they had a lot of money to take care of it, which is, of course, like some of people believe the origin of like the shaved head versus the long hair, round heads versus Cavalier. Okay. The other one is their fancy mustache that was very, very in at the time, a la Peter the Great. And the other big one was an ostrich feather that they would oftentimes wear from their hat, right? Because it was very, very expensive and trade with like throughout Africa had just increased. And so these actually these birds and these ostrich feathers actually were now coming into like Europe 
and they were considered a very, very great like hat decoration. And so now going into it, though, you also need to understand is that Cavaliers, they didn't name themselves that, right? They actually were called that by the other side, right? So like just exactly like the Cavaliers made up the name Roundheads, the Roundheads called them Cavaliers because it was actually meant to be kind of like a rude pun on this thing called Cavaliersos, which are the like Spanish cavalry and stuff like that that was usually known as being very weak and ineffective and very uppity and rich, right? Well, the thing that you need to understand, though, too, is who is leading the other side? If Charles and his advisors are leading the Cavaliers, then who the front door is leading these roundheads, right? Well, the big thing is, it's a very, very famous figure that you need to know very well, and you need to let this name burn itself into your memory. His name is Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell is going to be the leader of the roundhead forces during the English Civil War, and he is a very devout a Puritan, right? And he leads eventually the actual like roundheads to victory. Now we're going to cut through a lot of different stuff. I could talk all day long about the English Civil War, about the Battle of Edge Hill, the Battle of Naseby and stuff like that, about how the parliamentarians were winning a little and the Cavaliers were winning a little. And then when Oliver Cromwell shows up, he leads the like uh, roundheads to victory. But all you really need to know is that the roundheads win, right? The roundheads do actually end up winning. And what ends up happening the second that like Cro Cro Cromwell comes into power, he is now the leader of this winning army. He fires the member of parliament that do not support them or any of them that stink of that Thomas Wentworth vibe of supporting the king whatsoever. And he creates basically a parliament that will universally support him and his Puritan ideology. And every time we like talk about it, we usually refer to this as his rump parliament. Now this is going to get real bad. All right. So the rump parliament is going to be awful. Okay. It's not going to be fun. They're going to end up getting rid of a lot of fun stuff like throughout the entirety of like English history. But what we need to understand though, is that if Charles Charles is lost, so what happens to him at this point? Well, Cromwell gives him an out. He gives him an out and he says, if you sign these documents that forever limit your power and now so admit to the English people that you betrayed them, then you will actually be like kind of, you will become a monarch, but you'll be basically like a very weakened one. And he refuses to do that. And what ends up happening is they hold Charles on trial. The rump parliament supports Cromwell. And Charles I is the very first king in European history to be voted on by his people to be executed. And Charles I, when he goes out to be executed that day, apparently he wore two shirts because he didn't want to shiver in the cold. And apparently what also happened is he brought an orange that was stuffed with cloves because it smells really intense, so he didn't faint or pass out. But he put his head down onto the block and he was executed in front of a huge crowd of people that apparently came to watch his execution. And this means that we're entering a time period where there are no kings in England, all right? The king is dead, so we don't have any kings right now. So what you need to understand is we're now entering into the Commonwealth period. And the Commonwealth period is going to be about 11 years as well, from 1649 to 1660, when England has no king, and it's being led by Oliver Cromwell in the parliament, okay? But we'll talk more about that so we can better understand everything that I just talked about in this flip when I see y'all in class. Y'all have a good one.